This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. Our guest this week on Floss Weekly is Deb Goodkin of the FreeBSD Foundation. Sean Powers and I talked about all kinds of stuff having to do with FreeBSD versus the other BSDs, FreeBSD versus Linux, all of the amazing companies that actually use it, like Netflix and Sony and Apple, even, and lots of other companies, how those are involved, how um, how the whole thing is done. It's really different than what you're used to with Linux. And we just begin to get into all kinds of stuff about that. And that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 662. Recorded Wednesday, January 5th, 2022. Free BSD. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. Get endpoint management that puts the user first. Visit collide.com slash twit to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. Hello again. Good morning, good evening, good whenever it is, wherever you are, anywhere in the world. I am Doc Searles, and this is the first Floss Weekly of the year 2022. So welcome. And uh, my uh, guest host today is, uh, is Sean Powers who comes to us from deepest, darkest, whitest, snowiest um, Michigan. It's true, right? northern Michigan. And northern today it's Michigan. cold. It's, it's been a weird winter, but yeah, it's cold. You know, and and uh, the votes are in. I have been the best co-host of 2022 so far. So I'm just saying. <laughs> you got my vote. Got my vote yeah. so far. Yeah. Are you snowbound yet? Has that happened? Uh, we had a little I bit guess. of snow overnight, but okay. it's just, it's yeah. been a weird year. You know, it'll be icy and then it'll be sunny and like 60. And then the next day it'll be in the teens. So I, I don't know. Well, I, I am in Santa Barbara, California, <laughs> which is rather typically perfect right now. It's going to be about 70 today. <laughs> it's sunny. It's nice. Anyway, so, uh, so our guest today is Deb Goodkin of the uh, Free BSD Foundation. Are you? familiar with her or with it and uh, uh, not with her BSD no itself? freebsd uh, freebsd i mean uh, know what it is and you know a little about it not not a whole lot you know i'm a i'm a linux guy and so um i'm looking forward to hearing some of the the differences and similarities and um yeah i mean who doesn't who doesn't love open source technology that isn't Linux. I mean, it seems like everything this day is Linux, this Linux, that. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about FreeBSD. And that's like, I mean, there, there's like some original FreeBSD stuff that went into Mac OS 10 and uh, maybe she knows some of that history. Cause I, I mean, it's not running FreeBSD, but there's something FreeBSD ish about it. So anyway, I'm looking forward to asking those questions to somebody who might know. Yeah. So, and, and me too. And because we got a little bit of a late start, not that people watching or listening to the recording would know that, um, I want to get right into it and let people know that this episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Collide. Collide, that's K-O-L-I-D-E with a K, is a new take on endpoint management that asks the question, how can we get end users more involved? This is in contrast to old school device management tools like MDM, which lock down your employees' devices without considering their needs, or even attempting to educate them about the security of their laptop. Collide is built by like-minded security practitioners who in the past saw just how much MDM was disrupting their end users, often frustrating them so bad that they would throw up their hands and just switch to using their personal laptops without telling anyone. And that scenario, everyone loses. Collide, on the other hand, is different. Instead of locking down a device, Collide takes a user-focused approach that communicates security recommendations to your employees directly on Slack. After Collide is set up, device security turns from a black and white state to a dynamic conversation. This conversation starts with the end users installing the endpoint agent on their own through a guided process that happens right inside their first Slack message. From there, Collide regularly sends employees recommendations when their device is in an insecure state. This can range from simple problems like the screen lock not being set correctly to hard to solve and nuanced issues like asking people to secure two-factor backup codes 
sitting in their downloads folder properly. And again, it's talking directly to employees. Collide is educating them about the company's policies and how to best keep their devices secure using real tangible examples, not theoretical scenarios. Collide, cross-platform endpoint management for Linux, Mac, and Windows devices that puts end users first for teams that Slack. Get endpoint management that puts the user first. Visit collide.com slash twit to learn more and activate a free 14-day trial today. No credit card required. Visit kolide.com slash twit today. Okay, our guest today is Deb Goodkin of the FreeBSD Foundation. Um, She joined as the first employee back in August 2005, which though it's in this in this millennium is a long time ago. She's been there for a long time. Uh, before venturing into the world of open source and operating systems, she spent two decades working as an embedded firmware engineer, technical marketer, and technical sales engineer in the data storage industry. Besides running the FreeBSD Foundation, she now focuses on learning more about operating systems while adding for FreeBSD around the world. So welcome, Deb. Welcome to the show. Oh, hello there, there from Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> from Boulder, Colorado. That, that's Boulder as in the rock, not Boulder as in an attitude. Um, you just had some news <laughs> there, both. right? It, yeah, to, to, to locate this in time, this is right after fires roared through your vicinity there. I guess you're okay. If, uh, uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so today is what, Wednesday and um, Thursday, I was taking, I actually took a uh, the day off is a vacation day. And I spent um, basically the whole day sitting by my back window watching the fire and trying to figure out if we needed to evacuate or not. That's heavy. As you can see, this is my house. So yeah, it's, it's (laughs) it's not, not a fake background. We, yeah, living in Santa Barbara, we've had three fires that have come close to us here. And when I lived in the Bay area, we got to watch fires like across the Bay and Oakland and stuff. It, it's scary living living in the west is kind of a scary thing in general it's all new geology and new botany and it's a lot of it's flammable or as avalanches and other things but but anyway it's it's great to have you on the show and um so i i I kind of want to get to get because um bsd is in a lot of things including the very computer i'm talking to you over right now it's in it's a, a somewhat elderly mac um but it's one that works um, and BSD is in there. And there's, and I'm, I'm wondering if you could, you know, fill us in on, you know, for those of us who like me, who spend a lot of time in the Linux world to the to degree it's a world, what's, what distinguishes B, uh, BSD, free, BSD in general or free BSD in particular? But um, to clarify what distinguishes it from the other no, BSDs no, from, or from, from other operating from Linux, from Linux, from 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 the Unixes from which it was derived. You know, I, I mean, I I remember, you know, working at Sun, and you know, they were trying to work their own BSD while at the same time, or their own, you know, derived one while trying to do keep up with AT and T's SVR four or whatever it was at that time back in the eighties. But the world seems to be a more so- stable one now. Yeah. Yeah, so for, so um, so FreeBSD descends from uh, Berkeley Unix, which was um, continuation of Unix out of Bell Labs, and um, and so Berkeley worked on it for quite a few years, improving it, and it was uh, referred to as Research uh, Unix, and um, and then when the funding went away, basically. Uh, then there are a lot of folks who are still working on it and wanted to continue with that. And so that's where uh, FreeBSD and NetBSD were basically born or or continued or forked from that. Uh, So it's still considered a Unix-like operating system. Um, It's different than... uh, Windows and Mac because it is open source and free. Uh, Mac did uh, originate, or at least Darwin originated from uh, free BSD. So actually, they took components of BSD and then 
um, over the years, they replaced the BSD components with free BSD. And so you could say that Mac OS, a lot of, a lot of folks will, will say it's a, you know, like a free BSD based operating system. It's uh, different than Linux. Uh, a lot of times people <laughs> will confuse the two and they'll think FreeBSD is a, another Linux distribution and it's not, it's its whole uh, operating system. Like I said, it descended from Unix um, out of Berkeley and where Linux was created in the early nineties uh, from uh, Linus. And it's, uh, uh, it was, I believe to uh, be like a Minix replacement at that time, but, it, but it's also a Unix like operating system. So I, um, you know, my, I'm, I'm a Linux guy. I, my job is Linux stuff. I do Linux stuff all the time, but I'm not, I, I told myself I would not dominate this whole show asking like, uh, Linux <laughs> contrasting questions. So I, I'm actually curious about, uh, the relationship between, you know, you work at the, the FreeBSD foundation and that is separate from the FreeBSD project itself. And and if you could describe like what exactly that is, like the project I think is in charge of the operating system. And so what does the foundation do? And I mean, to the point of who, who reports to who, is it independent? How are they related? All of those things. I'm, I'm curious where, where those things land. Yeah, I, I mean, those are really good questions because a lot of folks get confused over the relationship or actually the differences between like the FreeBSD Foundation and, and other foundations like the Linux Foundation. And so the FreeBSD Foundation is a 501c3, which is a US uh, IRS tax classification. And that means we're for the public good. And there's other foundations um, and I'll use Linux Foundation as an example, they're a 501c6. They are a trade association. And so their, their purpose is to support the industry. Our purpose is to support the industry, but also basically the community. And, um, and like I said, it's for the, the public good. Um, so we we are a legal entity. We've been around for since 2000, so for a long time. And um, the, pro the FreeBSD project is... Uh, project of, of volunteers who are passionate about supporting the FreeBSD operating system. So, so we, our mission, the foundation's mission is for the project and the community. And, but we can also step in and um, we assign like license agreements, uh, NDAs, um, do we own the FreeBSD IP, um, I mean, which means it, like the, the trademarks, um, we can't, so we are a separate organization from the project, but like I said, our whole purpose is to support the project. So we're not an umbrella organization like some other foundations. So the pro the project is not like under us and we can't tell them what to do. And, but we can, um, what we do is we will uh, talk to users out there, whether they're individuals or, um, hold on. Mm -hmm. Apparently I didn't disable everything here. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, so we'll get input from uh, companies, corporations who are using FreeBSD, users out there, uh, other types of organizations like universities, uh, what they need, what they would like to see supported, what are they doing? And so the foundation, we actually have software engineers on staff. And so we can move forward and we can implement features and functionality uh, we can also step in quickly and fix bugs and uh, review changes from other committers. And so we we have the staff who's available to do that versus the project is is really comprised of, of volunteers. I mean, you do have employees of different corporations who are also getting paid to work on FreeBSD, but it, there are areas that maybe no one's interested in working on. And so we can step in and support those areas. So that, that actually uh, leads to an interesting question. So um, we generally like to eat food and, and, and live in a home 
when we live in cold weather like you and I do. Um, what wh- where does funding come for the FreeBSD Foundation? Because it it sounds I mean the the project sounds like it's uh, volunteer based, which is awesome. But there you know if, if the foundation is supporting the project and doing other things, um, wh- where does funding come from? So we're hundred percent funded by donations, and we get those donations from individuals. So usually. Uh, folks out there who are using FreeBSD or maybe contributing to FreeBSD and they want to support the efforts. And, but we got get most of our funding from uh, corporate donors. And so that would be companies like uh, Netflix, Juniper, NetApp. Um, actually, we have a donor page that, that lists a lot of the, the donors there. And so uh, oh, Google, um, back off companies like that and so uh they they trust how we're going to use the money it's never earmarked on how we're going to spend it but we've been around for a long time and we're uh fairly transparent with uh how we spend our money and we post it on our website our our financial reports uh the 990 is always available too and so, so anyway, that that's currently how we get our funding. Uh, we're always working on trying to get more. Uh, fu- fundraising is the hardest part of my job, uh, and so we're working on um, helping improve that this year. And and we do apply for grants too. So, uh, so part of our funding comes in from grants. I, I'm curious that. Um... One of the things that happened in the in the Linux world uh, when the Linux Foundation came along, and and I think it's really interesting that you characterize that as a trade association, um, and you know versus what you've got is which is more community oriented. And I'm wondering how you keep the community from becoming a trade association in a way. I mean, it, it, you say we, you know, the funding is not it comes from these companies and it's not earmarked, but no doubt some of the committers in the project um, work for these companies and these companies have interests. These companies have legitimate input in some cases that may have some really good influences on the code base, but in others may want to bias the code base toward their purposes and not others. And I'm wondering how you'd navigate that if, or if that's even an issue. Um, it- if for us, it really isn't an issue. We definitely have companies like uh, Netflix is a great example where uh, they contribute a lot to the code base. And I mean, this is how they get their high transfer rates that they do. And um, and they so they have uh, paid staff who work directly on FreeBSD. They use the current uh, branch of, of the code and um, they upstream as much as they can. So they really upstream most of their code. They also financially donate to us and um, we'll reach out to companies like them and ask them for, you know, what what are your challenges? And it just helps inform us on what we should uh, address, but we don't have, anytime a company comes to us and they need something specific implemented, then uh, we try to connect them to a company that can do that for them, and, and we don't we don't do that. So we will only make changes that will help improve FreeBSD for um, yeah you know, for most users out there. We don't have we currently don't have a technical advisory board, um, and and we have looked at changing our model to like a C six, but it doesn't seem like that would be the right solution for us. And and the whole reason why we would consider it would be for the funding. And so we're looking at um, just getting funding different ways and, and, you know, continuously reaching out to companies, whether they use FreeBSD or not. So, you know, there's companies uh, that just want to support the health of the open source ecosystem. And so by supporting us, that helps because, FreeBSD has been around for so long. I mean, we're one of the oldest, largest, most successful open source projects around. And um, and we're growing still. You, you don't hear about us a lot, but there's a lot of companies that base their products on FreeBSD. And so we at the foundation, we try to promote that when we can. We're actually trying to write more case studies and testimonials to promote that. But 
we don't have this big long membership list like the Linux Foundation has of that we can have logos on it, but we do put logos from donors on our donor page. So so right now, yet we um, like you're asking initially, we we don't have an issue with companies uh, trying to step in and uh, and basically tell us what to do because I mean really if a company tried to do that we still don't have control of the project. <laughs> and so uh, we, yeah, we we can help influence and guide and make suggestions, but we, we can't tell them what to do, which is what the people on the project want. I mean, they, they want to work on the things that they want to work on. So, if, I mean, if you think about the purpose of the project, it's not, frequency is a product. And a lot of companies use it in universities and stuff, uh, like I was saying. But still, a lot of people work on it because they're really interested in it. They're they're learning, they're contributing, uh, the, they're part of this community, and so there's a lot of other reasons to, um, so, yeah, for FreeBSD out there. Okay, so that whole conversation really got my my brain working now. Um, <laughs> So Linux is, is a kernel. I mean, Linux is, is a lot of things, but ultimately Linux is, is the kernel. Uh, FreeBSD is an entire operating system. So, I mean, there, there's some difference there. And, and I realize that your answer to the question I'll ask kind of will, will hinge on that, that difference. But uh, when it comes to Linux, I mean, you know, Linus is the guy who decides, you know, he's like the, the person who says, yes, that's going into the kernel. No, it's not going into the kernel. Um, you said there's not necessarily a, a tech advisory board for FreeBSD. What, what I'm curious about is who does make those decisions about what becomes a part of FreeBSD? I can just see a lot of contention and, and hopefully there's not. I mean, you know, people, you know, get along open source software. Uh, that would be that would be awesome. But I just see a lot of contention, especially if there are the companies who, you know, they, they really want a thing. Um, I, you know, you said like, well, we don't necessarily do just what the companies want, but, uh, you know, if one of those companies happens to be a big donator, that's a scary thing to say, no, um, who, who does ultimately make those decisions? And, and I realize the foundation and the, and the project are, are different as well. So maybe those layers help alleviate some of those, those areas of contention, but how does that work exactly? So the structure of the project is um, is pretty flat. So you have you do have a core team that is like the board of directors of the project. They're or like the upper management, and they do help influence and guide the project. And we work we try to work <clears throat> closely with the core team. We do have overlap with some of my team members are also on the core team. And so we, we take input from large corporations or corporations using FreeBSD. Uh, we take input from users out there and, uh, we, and we use that to inform what we should be doing. And, um, and the core team is, is really that guiding force of the leadership of the project. You don't have a benevolent dictator like uh, the Linux project. And um, anyone can contribute to the project. We don't have the whole lieutenant hierarchy, but it doesn't mean that the standards are any less. And the code gets submitted and it's reviewed and um, it's committed. It could be reverted to. So, um, so the difference is, is that you just have more people who can step in and help review changes and help decide if you know, this should stay or, or, or be committed to the code base. Uh, one thing actually, you know, sort of sidestep this here. I remember talking to someone, uh, actually Linus is a really good friend and big time Linux supporter. And he and I were having coffee, and this was a few years ago. And he goes, you know, if I were to join open, if I was new and I were to join an open source project, I would I would join FreeBSD or contribute to FreeBSD. And um, and I was like, well, why? Because <laughs> I thought I was so surprised to hear this from him. And and he said, well, because it's so much easier to you know, to uh, 
contribute to the project. You, you may wait months to get anything accepted in Linux because that whole hierarchy structure. And that's when I really understood what, um, you know, that the difference is there. And, and like I was saying, it doesn't mean the standards or the quality, you know, or any less. It's just, it's just different. And so, uh, so that's one thing about like, if folks are looking at contributing to an open source project, FreeBSD is nice because it is easier to uh, contribute and to make a, <laughs> uh -oh, <laughs> a notable difference. Hold on. <laughs> I Normal things happen. I'm, I'm not it's really... Okay. <laughs> I'm not loving these earpods. <laughs> so funny. So um, um, so and and one other thing to note too is that if there is anything like a technical dispute that came within the project, then the core team, like I was talking about, they would uh, be the arbitrator for that. And and the core team is made up of nine folks that are elected by the um, the committers of the project. And um, and so an election happens every two years and actually elections will come up uh, this summer. It probably starts in May. I don't know the dates of it, but um, but that's how, yeah, I, I know that these look really funny, but <laughs> I don't wear them right. <laughs> but anyway, that's nice distraction from my answer, right? <laughs> Did it answer your question? <laughs> That, that, that is good. Um, you know, we all have our little technical things. I was thinking that, I mean, I, my headphone problem is I have brand new headphones. They're like the best ones Bose make. And they have such a good seal on my head. They're just heating my head right up. Anyway, um, I, I, I want to pause for a moment. And and I, we have a question actually from the back channel. Um, but first, I want to let people know about Club Twit. Um, joining Club Twit is another great way to support our network, the Twit Network. Um, as a member, you get access to ad-free versions of all the shows on Twit, including this one and other great benefits. There's a bonus Twit Plus feed that includes footage and discussions that didn't make the final show edit, as well as bonus shows who started, such as the Untitled Linux Show, hosted by our very own Jonathan Bennett, uh, the Giz Fizz, and other monthly members-only content. Uh, there's the community aspect. We have a really fun Discord server that's available only for our Club Twit members. Uh, there you can chat with other members about the shows and many other uh, tech topics and non-tech topics. Everything's on the table there. There's even a beer and cocktails chat on our Discord. So sign up uh, Club Twit for the cost of one fancy cup of coffee a month. That's just $7 a month. It gets you into the club. Head over to twit.tv slash club twit and join today. So, so to get to the back channel one, um, I have to scroll up a little bit to see it because we have a lot of action over there. Um, uh, it's about the free BSD license. Um, uh, we have hard to say whether the OS or the license is the biggest contribution to open source. Um, so tell us a little bit about that and the difference between that and other relatively liberal licenses, you might say. Oh gosh. Okay. So I'm not great at licenses, but so to compare it to yeah. other permissive licenses. I, I'm not either, but it's easy to I, ask. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, really it, when, when I compare, when people say, well, what's the difference between FreeBSD and Linux or why should I use FreeBSD over Linux? Uh, the BSC license is a big reason. And so what it means is that it's a permissive license and it, you can take the code and you can make your changes and you don't have to give those changes back. So, and that means you could turn it into proprietary code. So for example, um, that would be companies like Apple, like Sony. Uh, it's, so Sony uses uh, FreeBSD um, as the foundation of their operating system and their Playstations. And, um, and so you, you can't get access for that code. If it was a, a Linux, a GPL type of a licensed code, then yes, you could ask for it. And they would have to provide it. And so that is why a lot of companies use it. And um, and the philosophy of the project is, is they're fine with it. They, um, they are working on a product 
that they want folks to use. And so it's just a different philosophy. And um, and so it's just really interesting to see those differences because I could also understand being a developer and, you know, if you're making billions of dollars from the work I'm doing, you know, I would like some credit for that. And, and so it's, it's, it's just different. Um, a lot of companies too, um, actually most companies out there still contribute or upstream their changes back to us. So like, so I'll use Netflix for example, again, too, just because they are such a large uh, contributors to FreeBSD, uh, they upstream almost all their, their changes and they just keep a small portion of their code as proprietary code. And uh, we actually have a really nice case study written up on, on our website if you're interested in, uh, in how they use the FreeBSD and how they get such incredibly high uh, transfer rates. Actually, they've, they've over the past few years, they've given a few talks on how they're using FreeBSD. And so it's really, it's pretty cool. Uh, so speaking of pretty cool, how's this for a segue? Um, I'm a little <laughs> bit curious. You know, we were talking about licensing. We we're talking about all those things. Can, can you tell me a little bit about the mascot? Because I, I'll be honest that that he probably had a name and, and I'm a Linux guy, so I know Tux's name, but I don't know the, the little devil's name. But what happened? Because I don't see him anymore. Was that just a... a marketing choice or, or what, what happened there so um okay so uh, so beastie who oh actually here i have because i keep let's see if we can see this so this is BC. Yes, that's him <laughs> <laughs> he's so cute so this was the free bsd logo it's 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 really the the bsd logo and yeah and you see it on the freebsd.org website um i i really don't know the history um of when it changed, but basically, so Beastie was a play on how the, there's this, in the, in the Unix world, you have these background processes called demons. And so, um, oh gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of the art of, the Disney artist who created the logo, who actually created this design and, and, and the play on was on the demon as well as the BSD name. So BSD is a play on BSD. So it was the, um, so it's like, oh, I think it's John Lester, who's really big at Disney now. But anyway, he, he did the oh, original wow. design. Yeah. Uh, Kirk McCusick owns the trademark for it. And, um, and so it's still the BSD mascot. And that hasn't changed. But there was a certain time when... Um, I think there was a little pushback or concern about having something that looked like the devil as, you know, as the mascot and the logo. And so all the BSD projects actually changed their logos. And so uh, FreeBSD did too. And we have this, it's a red, um, i trying to see if I have anything here with it on. I, I, I can't see anything here, uh, but it's it's not as cute, but it's like a red. We call it a bobblehead. It's like a round uh, red ball with with ears on it, and um, and yeah, you have the page of the B, the history of the BSD uh, demon, and then actually, if you go back to the freebsd.org page too, then um, you'll you should see on the top left there. That's that's actually the BSD or FreeBSD logo now. That's the official logo and and right when i joined around 2005 the they had a community competition for the artwork to submit artwork and so that was actually one of the um uh submissions for that competition that's the one that won and then we took over ownership of uh of that logo that graphic and we've had that ever since but it's still people um so we'll call BSD free BSD logo, and we just over time are, you know, continuing trying to make sure people know that it's really a BSD mascot, and it's it's not the free BSD logo. All right. So thankfully, there there aren't really any uh, controversies with penguins that I know of. So I think Tux mm -hmm. is safe. <laughs> Tux is safe and, and Tux is cute. I, I may even have, eh, I think I have a Tux hiding here. 
<laughs> so, Doctor, do you go ahead? You had a question about. Well, actually, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking around. It's, uh, uh, first of all, I'm blown away. There's John Lazeter, who's a pretty famous uh, uh, animation guy. Uh, director yeah, Doc and I are in the so back channel going, oh that. my gosh. Like, whoa. Um, <laughs> That's that, that's that's pretty radical. I had no idea that, that he was the guy. Well, can, uh, can I can I interject something here then too sure. on the history? So <laughs> the other thing that's really cool too is so I mentioned Kirk McCusick is is the owner of the trademark of of BC. Uh, so Kirk McCusick is one of the original BSD developers. He was at Berkeley when they were working on the Berkeley Unix, and he still contributes to the project. And he's on our board of directors and he's like, we refer to him as a rock star. I mean, he's so approachable and he loves to talk to folks about FreeBSD. He loves to help. He gives tutorials and, um, and he, and when he was actually at Berkeley working on, uh, the Berkeley Unix, uh, uh, Oh my gosh, no, um, a joy. Um, oh gosh, Bill maybe joy. someone will help me. Bill Joy uh, was also there too. He worked on, I mean, there's a lot of names out there that worked on Berkeley Unix. And so Bill Joy came up with this idea of this company he wanted to start. And he actually asked Kirk to join and the company was Sun. And at the time, Kirk was like, oh no, I've got to finish my PhD. And, and so he said it was like one of the biggest mistakes he made and, and don't get business advice from him. But um, yeah, the story is great. And, and he'll he'll talk about the history of FreeBSD. In fact, I, I think I included a link to um, one of his write-ups on the history of FreeBSD and BSD too. And uh, it's it's always really interesting to, to hear his talks. So you can go I, on I, with I, your next yeah, question. Yeah, no, it's, I, it's, while you're talking, I'm, I'm running through uh, connections, uh, Kurt Bikusik. Um, uh, you know, these are names I haven't paid attention to in years. And it turns out his spouse is Eric Allman, which is, I did not know that either. He created SendMail. Um, there are so many connections in, in, in the communities. I'd like to ask about, I mean, and this is really old. It's not even news. This might even be prehistory, but um, th there was a time when there was this kind of a conflict going on between FreeBSD and OpenBSD and NetBSD and for all I know, other kinds of BSD. Is any of that still around? Does anybody care? Is that, is that still an issue of any, at, at, any, at any level? Uh, not really. We uh, so there are BSC conferences that happen around the world, uh, typically with three or four a year, and so all the BSDs folks are there, and um, and and they, each project has its own like purpose or philosophy, and uh, yeah, FreeBSD is the largest right now, and. Um, and NetBSD is, uh, I mean, I mean, if you if if you think back on like, so why why was there NetBSD and FreeBSD? NetBSD wanted to work like on every, any type of platform. OpenBSD, uh, they wanted to be more secure. Uh, FreeBSD is really se secure. So it, there's just different philosophies there. Uh, we share code. Uh, we actually will have NetBSD folks work on FreeBSD. And, um, and so there's, I mean, I, I would say that there's like rivalries like you have with sports teams and we'll like joke around. But when I think about when I'm at these conferences, it's fun to hang around with folks from all the projects. And, um, and, and it's always really interesting to see like folks from our project work with folks from other projects and because that's how you learn and and share and if if like open bsd has something that we think would be really helpful in free bsd then we try to get someone to port that or even maybe get an open bsd person to to help us and I, I, I have a oh go ahead, oh, go ahead. You have go a ahead question, sean man. Well, I just had a quick question. So um, it's something Jonathan was talking about in the in the IRC. Um, so with Linux, we have 
11,000 distributions that are built on top of the Linux kernel. For better or for worse, there's advantages and disadvantages. Since FreeBSD is an entire operating system, are there uh, flavors of FreeBSD? I mean, I, I know the, the Mac OS thing where like they use parts of FreeBSD, but that, that doesn't count because that's that's weird. But are there are there different flavors or or just different like uh, install use cases? How does that work uh, compared to what a, a lot of us would be familiar with with regards to Linux and distributions? Right. So we have, so we basically, free, FreeBSD is one distribution. It's the whole operating system. If you look at Linux, it's the kernel. And like you said, there's a, a zillion uh, different flavors or distributions out there. And, and you have to try to figure out which one you should use. You can't just run or Linux by itself. Uh, so FreeBSD includes, it, you know, it's a whole operating system. It includes both the kernel, uh, the user land, documentation, the tools, and uh, which makes it attractive to use because it's a, you know, one cohesive system. It's developed all together. It's tested together. It's created by one community. And, um, but there are, you know, I, I'm not exactly sure if we, should refer to it as a distribution, but there are, are different flavors out there. Uh, for example, there's um, some more desktop oriented distributions like Hello Systems, Midnight BSD, Ghost BSD. And those are geared more towards folks who want to use FreeBSD as a desktop and make it a little easier to get started because they, they typically will have a nice uh, GUI. Whereas if you just install FreeBSD, uh, the base system, uh, you, you and you want that, you have to set that up yourself. So um, there's always people who, who want to work, improve that, like especially like the onboarding process, getting new folks to use FreeBSD. And, um, and so starting with something like a Hello Systems um, makes it a lot easier. And then you could always, if you install that, then you can go to the command line and still um, okay. do FreeBSD and things. But it is still FreeBSD, so I mean, the like package management is still with ports and and all that stuff. Those don't change with the that, uh, correct. Yeah, that is correct. Yep. Okay. And you have, and then you have uh, uh, derivatives, or you have uh, other products out there that folks, a lot of folks, are familiar with. PF Sense is based on FreeBSD. Uh, the FreeNAS that was also uh, ba or is based on FreeBSD. I, I, I'm wondering about, oh. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. I was, I was just trying to think of free NAS, how they do the package system, but I, I can't remember. So, but yeah, I mean, usually, so if, and if you look at the base system, uh, the base system is what you install from FreeBSD. It has everything that you really need to run FreeBSD. And then there's over 30,000 ports that you can install that. So say you want, um, Oh, you want to access the internet, so you can install Firefox. And if you want like uh, uh, word processing, you could do LibreOffice or uh, another software. Actually, I think the number now is over forty thousand software packages. It's, it's pretty unbelievable. So I mean, so the idea is, I mean, you can use FreeBSD as your desktop operating system. It's known in the server world um, as a you know, great operating system. But uh, you can all you can definitely use it on the desktop, and that's something that the foundation is working to improve this year is to uh, put more resources into supporting areas like Wi-Fi and graphics to improve that experience. Okay, so then uh, let's let's push that further along right now. Why should someone try using FreeBSD? Right, there's a lot of options out there. What? Why would they? potentially want to try FreeBSD free of any sort, whether it's the, the ones you mentioned that are a little more user-friendly at first or, you know, just core FreeBSD? So, I mean, when, when people ask me that, um, it, it usually uh, what comes first to my mind is the community. So, if you're, so whether you're contributing or using FreeBSD, free it's, a uh, welcoming and inclusive community. And so why is that good? I mean, if you're a contributor, then you feel, um, I mean, you're part of this community. I mean, if, if you look at like, why get involved in open source in general? Because there's so many open source projects out there. You pick it 
because it, it might be a technology you're interested in. But you also pick it because of the community, because these are the people you're going to be working with. And if I were to volunteer in a project, I want it to be welcoming and inclusive. And so if I want to uh, contribute something, and maybe I'm not sure about something, I want to feel comfortable asking a question and not being put down because I don't know how to do it or, or even the fact that I'm asking the question. So you don't get that in the FreeBSD community. Um, and it's also you know, easy to ask questions because we have so many different uh, like forums to be able to ask questions from Twitter to Facebook to forums to emails. We had, um, so there's, there's different ways to do that. Oh, IRC too. Um, and then FreeBSD is known for its excellent documentation. And so what that means is that it's, it's fairly easy to find the information that, um, you, that you want. And so if you're trying to do something, um, you can Google it and usually find the information uh, pretty quickly. And uh, and the FreeBSD handbook is actually something you can sit down on a you know snowy day by the fireplace and read, and it's actually really interesting. I've done that. Uh, and so, um, you know, and then um, other reasons that people uh, might want to use or or be part of or, or learn about FreeBSD really is because um, it's because of the size of the operating system. Um, it's a much smaller code base to learn from. So say you want to become a systems programmer, you want to learn about operating systems in general, that you have this, you know, production quality, full operating system that you can actually look at that source code and, and learn as well as you can um, also get, you know, start coding as a systems programmer and you can um, become a significant contributor because our community is small. And so for example, uh, we had an intern and who's actually now, he's now since graduated and so he's continuing to work for us, but he started um, at the University of Waterloo, which we do the we work with them on their um, in their co-op program, and um, and so he wor started working at Risk Five, and then he um, he's continuing to work on that, and um, and so he's as a student, he was one of the main he was able to learn about this like specific area and. Um, become a significant contributor to this area. And so, um, I mean, it could sound like, oh, well, we take these novice folks and they take over significant portions of the code, but that's not the case at all. It's like we had, we have great mentors in that, that area too. And so it was um, by having that, um, you know, that mentor philosophy that he was able to come up to speed really quickly. And because he had that interest in that area, then he was able to take a little more ownership of that too. That's, um, that's awesome. So our, our, um, I mean, that kind of sounds like the sort of thing that the, the foundation was designed for, right. To, uh, to bring people in. Well, so on that note, what are, do you, I, I assume you have a roadmap. What are your big plans for 2022 as the FreeBSD foundation? W what are you hoping to accomplish? What direction are you going? Um, and how could people get involved? So, okay. So that's a lot. So, uh, we do have a technology roadmap that we wrote about, um, oh, I may have to provide the URL for that. But basically what we did was last year, we sat down and looked at like what, what areas of FreeBSD should we step in and support? And so we kind of came up with like four main areas. And we staffed up last year. And we have, I think we have about 11 full-time employees now and then some part-time contractors. And so one area that we're supporting um, is the ARM 64-bit ARM. And that's become a, a tier one platform for the project. And so we have um, one and a half folks working on that. 
the other areas, uh, like I said earlier, was desktop and really to improve the desktop experience. And so, uh, so that includes the uh, improving the Wi-Fi and the graphics support, and um, and making sure that FreeBSD is working on newer hardware. And so we're purchasing more laptops and newer hardware to make sure FreeBSD works. Uh, we're improving the developer tools and. Um, uh, let me think of some other areas. The The other thing is too, I mean, I've been focusing on technology, but advocating for FreeBSD. We have a, a marketing group. Uh, it's small, but uh, we have two full-time employees there. And um, and marketing really is, is advocating for FreeBSD. So they spend most of their time uh, writing up blog posts to promote different, uh, you know, features in FreeBSD, what work is being done. And it may or may not be stuff that the foundation is doing. We're definitely trying to promote a lot or write up a lot of the work that we're doing. So folks know out there what we're doing and um, especially just how we're spending our money. So we're trying to be really transparent with that. They also write a lot of how-to guides and we're helping improve the onboarding process. So how do, so how do we get new people involved in FreeBSD? And so it's providing some of those, those guides on, you know, to set up a virtual machine, install FreeBSD and try, try this and that. Some of the things that, that we want to add to that uh, are, um, I would really like to provide more training opportunities and uh, maybe doing it uh, online where we have online tutorials when the pandemic started, we realized that we weren't going to be able to do in-person events for a while. Um, I mean, who knew it would be this long? But we started a FreeBSD Friday series. And uh, we have close to 20 talks. And they're all like FreeBSD 101 type of talks in different areas of FreeBSD. And so you can access that on our, our YouTube, well, the FreeBSD's YouTube channel and learn about FreeBSD that way. I have a couple of questions that might be related. I'm not sure. Um, one is, you may have already covered it. Um, when one of your um, big corporate uh, implementers of, of FreeBSD, like uh, you're on the PlayStations, which is interesting to me, and on, um, and of course on, on the Macs, when they make a hardware change, like a big hardware change, Apple made a giant hardware change where suddenly they may have, for all I know, I don't even know if there's a new uh, instruction set with that or not, or if there is, does that, inf does that show up? Does that influence development? And then I have another question that may or may not be related as well, which is what's the split between um, users that are purely on the server side, the UI and everything is all about server applications and being used in mostly in corporate uh, circumstances versus pure user, you know, and is there a large enough code base or a large enough base of ordinary apps that regular users might use? And I'm just wondering if those even might be related. So, oh, so the first question, what was the first question again? The, the, the first sorry, question had to do with, with, with when, when, when a big corporate uh, operator like, like oh. an Apple or like a, or, or like a, Sony, I guess, was the PlayStation makes a change. They're doing something. They're using your OS. They're implementing it, in, implementing it in a new way, maybe a new iron. That's what happened with Apple when they went from Intel to uh, to their own iron. Does that does that cascade upward into into the operating system that they're using or the parts of it that they're using? Um. Well, as far as Apple goes, uh, there are definitely folks who want to use FreeBSD on those systems, and so they'll run it, and uh, and so they'll test. Uh, you know, they'll if there's any issues, then um, then they will try to get that support added. As far as like Apple goes, it diverged so long ago that. Um, I mean, that's something that they work on internally. And so mm. they, and the same with Sony too. Um, 
So, I mean, there there are companies that will work with us to make sure that FreeBSD is running on their newer products. For example, um, AMD has been great about uh, reaching out to us and offering us systems to make sure that FreeBSD uh, works on their new processors out the door, which has been uh, which has been great for us and and great for them too because that way we have early access and um and we don't um yeah we, there's no you know we usually take care of any issues before uh, their products are released so um so companies like that it's we we really welcome that to be able to um you know get it's usually what cp is right to make sure um, FreeBSD works on them. Like ARM is, is a good example too. It's what I used to do in storage, actually. Actually, mm -hmm. I, I worked at Next. Um, I, I mean, I didn't work at Next. Next used um, our storage or you know, disk drives. And so I would go there and work on site to make sure that their applications and every software worked with our disk drives. And so that was always interesting. And always, I only bring up Next because Next was a BSD shop. And when Apple bought them, um, they had, you know, there were like two versions of operating systems, the Apple and the Next. And actually, and, um, and they took the Next operating system and that's what everything was based on. And so uh, that's why it's BSD and free BSD based. Okay, so yeah, yeah that we is, could do a whole yeah. other show on um, on Next. That was my first love of of Unix based operating systems. There was <clears throat> there was a lab of Next cubes at college when I was there. Oh. <laughs> was it in, in those Next cubes? I mean, <laughs> it took Sean out. <laughs> there he goes. We took Sean. Took out Sean. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Next Next was like you know with that cube. It was such a a different design and it was it was so cool um you know when they were out there and it, it was it was just so so different at that time it was it was a pretty cool company it's funny that one of the first next machines i saw was that uh, uh that phil hughes had phil when he started linux journal we were actually thinking of doing a next a next magazine as well we we're looking way back and of course, the first time the web worked internationally was between two next machines. So, so there's there's oh, that as okay. well. We, yeah, we're we're in. There's another whole story. Unfortunately, the person I know who told me this story is gone from Earth at this point. So, I have to have to get Tim Berners Lee or somebody else in on that one. But uh, in the meantime, we're we're really at the wrap point. So we generally oh, yeah. close with there's four questions. The first is: Is there a question that we haven't asked you like to like us to have asked? Um, and that you could answer briefly. Um, not, it's cool. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. of course, drawing a blank. Uh, but if there's mm -hmm. anyone out there who's watching, who um, works at a company who wants to support FreeBSD, support the health of, um, you know, the open source software, uh, you know, please reach out to me, and so I could talk to the company about. Um, yeah, supporting our efforts. That would be one thing. Oh, that's great. That's uh, great. So, when, and then uh, yeah, I guess yeah. some upcoming things too um, that I was thinking about um, that I just sort of wanted to throw out there was that we are going to have a stand at POSDOM because yeah, it's virtual again this year. Uh, we're always at POSDOM. It's a great conference. Uh, we just uh, sent out a, a CFP to um, to the community and it's open to outsiders too who want to get involved with FreeBSD and maybe have a, a project idea that we would like to fund. Um, and so I'll I think we provided the link to that too. And like I mentioned earlier is that we do have uh, BSD, well, not us, but uh, there's organizers around the world that uh, put on the BSD conferences. And the first one that will take place in person, fingers crossed, would be BSD CAM, which is in Ottawa, Canada. And that will be in early June. And then the next one is Vienna, uh, Austria, which will be in late September. So it's all based on yeah, the, the, what's happening with COVID. Uh, but we also put on, we, the foundation also puts on uh, developer summits. 
And so we'll, we will also put one on uh, in person if possible. Otherwise, we'll continue online. I, I was that's, remembering that's by the way, the, the, uh, FreeBSD has always been a, a really uh, aggressive participant. And I mean, in a positive way and conferences, I remember it had in some ways the biggest booth at the early Linux worlds when the Linux world was a thing. They were just back in 99, 2000, turn of the millennium, you know, with a giant beastie there and a giant booth. It was pretty cool. Um, so uh, three more. Uh, do you have anything to say about blockchain? That's uh, one don't. of our kind of control questions. That's good. Um, that's easy. And what is your favorite text editor and scripting language, if you have some? Uh, my favorite text editor is it would be VI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and scripting language, do you? Um, oh, script. Um, well, so, I, I mean, right now I just use the default in FreeBSD, which I believe is just yeah. a regular um, shell or the born shell. That's cool. That's, uh, yeah, that's, a, that's excellent. It has been great having you on the show. We'll have to have you back. Um, you've, you've teed up a whole lot of subjects that we could go deeper into. So I'm really hoping to have you back in the near enough future. Thanks. For yeah, I'm going to be trolling. Yeah. yeah. I'm going yeah. to be trolling <laughs> eBay for next cubes now because I, I really want yeah. to. You got Sean on the don't, Just don't get choked up about it, Sean. <laughs> oh my goodness, that was something. <laughs> yeah, they were cool. They were cool. But yeah, thank so you. For, thank you for having yeah. us. Really appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. And thank you too. So Sean, quickly enough, how was that for you? Oh, uh, that was cool. You know, and, and I came in expecting to... Um, have to stop myself from just talking about Linux the whole time because, you know, that's that's the world I live in. Uh, but it was interesting to hear, uh, you know, uh, almost like a parallel world uh, experience with an open source operating system and, and all of those things that, uh, you know, I love about Linux also exist in the FreeBSD world. So yeah, it was, it was actually really cool. I appreciated it. The, the dynamic between the foundation and the project was interesting and it's still interesting, you know, to see how, how mm -hmm. that works, uh, because it certainly isn't clear on, on the face. You know, I mean, uh, when I heard that she was from the FreeBSD foundation, I didn't realize that there wasn't, or that there was a separate group in charge of the actual code. So yeah. So I learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting stuff. I've, I found that the, Linus story and the, the the next story were also pretty interesting. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, the, 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 I, I really do wish I uh, had a next cube. They're so cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, this is uh, Sean. Uh, what, what do you want to plug? Your your how many how many cartoons have you done so far? A couple hundred so oh, far in your script? yeah. So I think like getting close to two hundred and fifty comics. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, today's was was interesting. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, so I didn't, I didn't get good sleep last night. So it was just a single pain comic today of just me being silly, but, um, yeah, so my comic also uh, this year, 2022 for me is going to be a lot of, um, <clears throat> a lot of videos on YouTube. So youtube.com slash Sean powers with a zero for the O and that's my YouTube channel. I'm going to, I'm going to put a lot of Linux, um, stuff on there this year. So yeah, that's my focus for 2022. I'm going to still do yeah. the comic. Don't get me wrong. And your cartoon uh, yeah, I'm gonna make is my big round. Video. Yeah, my big round world. My big round world. Right. Yeah, right, right, yeah. right there. So, so make sure we have the complete plug there. <laughs> okay, great. Well, okay, thanks. Thanks, Sean. Uh, thank you, Dev. Thank you, everybody. This has been another week of Floss Weekly. And as as is the custom, I am not up on next week. Um, <laughs> so, so it'll be good. Sandra Hooker. Okay. I can barely hear the voice of my ear telling me that. So, um, St Sandra Henry Stocker. Okay, great. So that's next week and we will see you then. <laughs> Take it easy. So you got yourself the brand new latest and greatest iPhone or Samsung smartphone because you heard about all of the beautiful photography those things can create. But for some reason, you're just not quite getting it done with when you try to make your photos or you got yourself a brand new camera because you were interested in getting started in photography. But eh, your little new inexpensive camera still isn't quite cutting it. Well, you need to check out my show. 
hands-on photography here on Twit. I'm going to show you how to be a better photographer and a better post processor. And quite frankly, just help you get the most out of that new camera that's, that's either on your phone or the brand new one that you just got for your, your birthday or gifts or what have you. And it's going to be a lot of fun. So head on over to twit.tv hop. That's twit.tv hop and subscribe today.